we're good. Well, good afternoon or good evening uh, or good morning, depending on which time zone you're joining us from. Uh, and welcome to uh, this very significant uh, webinar from Hong Kong Watch, uh, the launch of a really important new report uh, that we just published uh, earlier this week, uh, Red Capital in Hong Kong, the Invisible Hand Transforming the City's Politics. Um, my name is Benedict Rogers. I'm a co-founder and the chief executive of Hong Kong Watch. Uh, and I really want to start by paying tribute to my colleagues, uh, Johnny Patterson and Sam Goodman, who researched and, and wrote this report. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome our very distinguished panel to help us unpack uh, the findings, the recommendations and the issues that this uh, report draws to, to light. I, I think it's a really, a really important report because it is a, a warning sign, not just uh, uh, based on research of um, what has happened in Hong Kong, but a warning sign for the rest of the world uh, of the dangers of uh, the Chinese Communist Party's use of economic and financial coercion uh, and uh, the risks that uh, increased dependency uh, on the part of international companies for access to uh, the China market uh, poses. Uh, red capital, in summary, uh, a phrase that refers to uh, capital flows uh, linked to the Chinese Communist Party regime, uh, has paved the way, as this report uh, shows, for the dismantling of Hong Kong's freedoms in, in almost every sphere. Uh, it uh, has directly affected the right to freedom of expression and association of ordinary people, ordinary employees in major corporations in Hong Kong. It's uh, placed political activists, and we'll hear more about this from one of our speakers, Ted Hui, uh, uh, in direct uh, financial uh, threat. Um, it's uh, weakened and compromised and undermined the influence of any business leaders or tycoons in Hong Kong who may in the past have had more sympathies for the pro-democracy movement. And speaking as someone who began my uh, career as a journalist in Hong Kong, uh, the direct impact uh, of Red Capital on uh, media freedom is particularly stark. And all of that is detailed um, in this report that if you haven't seen um, is available on our website. Um, so it's a really great privilege to uh, welcome our uh, four very distinguished speakers today. Um, just before I uh, do so, uh, let me say that when we come to a time of, of Q&A, um, you can send your questions directly to me in the chat function, and I will uh, uh, look at them and uh, raise uh, as many as we have time for. Um, but I'm really pleased that we're joined by by four speakers to, to help unpack different dimensions of this issue. Uh, Dr. Multi K. Ding, who is a, a lecturer in international politics at the University of Surrey and a real expert on this, has written very widely on Red Capital. Ted Hui, who I'm sure needs no introduction to anyone who follows Hong Kong, uh, a former uh, elected pro-democracy legislator uh, who, uh, along with the rest of his colleagues in the pro-democracy camp, uh, uh, was uh, effectively uh, disqualified or, or uh, dis uh, forced out of the Legislative Council last November and then had to flee uh, into exile very soon uh, after that. Uh, my colleague, Donnie Patterson, who's Hong Kong Watch's Director of Policy, who's one of the authors of the report, uh, and I'm delighted that Rashanara Ali, uh, Member of Parliament for uh, Bethnal Green and Bow. Uh, and a member of the House of Commons Treasury Select Committee uh, is uh, with us uh, as well. And our speakers will speak in the order that I've just um, mentioned them. Um, uh, so without any further ado, I'm really pleased to uh, give the floor, or I don't know if you call it a floor virtually, but give, give the space to Dr. Multi K. Ding. Thank you very much, uh, Ben, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, for this really important uh, report and event. So um, when we look at uh, red capital, I think the, our research interest in red capital really uh, began uh, from our observation on globalization and China's role in it. And because the phenomenon of a red capital should not only interest those who have vested interest in Hong Kong, as uh, uh, 
Ben said, but also those who are interested in how China plays a part in the future of globalization. And Hugo Wang uh, wrote about this in Globalization Against Democracy. So China's success has been built on the institutional weaknesses of global capitalism, and it simply um, yeah, profits and benefits from the pitfalls of globalization. And therefore, Chinese-style capitalism is a fruit of rather than a cure to the crisis of capitalism. And I think uh, the research of the Hong Kong Watch report on red capital uh, offers us uh, some initial insights into the conversation about the future of globalization under a Chinese uh, uh, rule or Chinese influence. And uh, red capital uh, differs from other capital due to this political core, um, as the party state uh, expects red capital um, to deliver objectives uh, which are beyond the commercial and business interest. And red capital therefore almost replicates this state uh, capital nexus uh, we know from, from China in Hong Kong and morphs the game of competition in favor of uh, Chinese nationally uh, controlled uh, companies. And consequently, um, Chinese economic actors compromise, as uh, Ben said, democratic institutions, which are uh, deemed obstacles to uh, these uh, state, state control. So when we look at what red capital is, um, in the narrow sense, it's uh, really uh, age shares. So these are mainland incorporated uh, companies or red ships, uh, which are overseas uh, incorporated companies listed at the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And we have three, three types of red capital uh, in Hong Kong. So these are centrally owned enterprises, which functions really as the embodiment of national interest. So they could be in the uh, resources uh, like uh, aviation, telecommunication, transportation, for example, we have locally um, uh, uh, owned um, SOEs, so state owned enterprises, who act for the interests of the various uh, local governments, like Qingdao Brewery, for example. Um, but other uh, SOEs also who have to somehow balance between uh, commercial interest. Uh, and political interest because their managers have to follow, um, yeah, to maximize profit, but their careers are really determined by the party. And I would just want to uh, say a few words now in the end on the influence this uh, red capital, these entities do have um, on politics, uh, especially um, on politics uh, on the local level in, in Hong Kong. I've studied elections in Hong Kong for almost like 15 years now, and Throughout these many observations we did, we've encountered the rising influence of mainland capital in Hong Kong, but it was for a long time quite piecemeal. But um, I think now what we can investigate and what we can find, and I think what the report really nicely highlights are really these three pathways of influence uh, on politics in Hong Kong. And the most direct one uh, was mentioned by Ben already, that's really influencing public opinion through media, which I think the report highlights very well, has mainland linkages and also by manipulat manipulating uh, election by exerting pressure on mainland entities and their, their local rec recruits. Yeah, so whom you have to vote for, who you are forced to vote for uh, in upcoming elections. Secondly, um, strategically, Beijing does also cultivate uh, political agents on the ground who are financially linked uh, to mainland capital and therefore completely loyal because they don't have any independent power base in Hong Kong. And these new agents by Beijing are linked to uh, red capital, then weaken local political elites. For example, in, in the new territories, we've seen this quite, quite a lot. And finally, red capital also employ, is employed to weaken local economic interests and elites by employing mainland capital and resources to uh, assist national firms in market competition. So using the market to crowd out uh, competitors, local competitors, especially in the real estate um, sector. But you can, of course, argue that it's highly doubtful that these local businesses and elites had ever had the, the interest of common ordinary uh, Hong Kong peoples in mind because for many years they worked very closely 
with uh, uh, the, uh, Beijing uh, and to deny, for example, Hong Kong also universal suffrage. Nevertheless, I think it's quite telling that even if you align with Beijing, you now cast aside uh, and only the strategic interest of the re re regime in Beijing directly uh, count now. So in conclusion, I think the nature and influence of red capital in Hong Kong provides us with some crucial insights into the impact of on um, free market economies, liberal societies with democratic institutions and sheds a light on how Chinese style globalization might look like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Multi, for that very uh, comprehensive and, and uh, informative, but also very concise uh, uh, summary of the, the issue. Um, it's a great pleasure now to welcome uh, Ted Hui. Um, uh, Ted, uh, over to you. Thank you, Ben, uh, for the introductions. Uh, before going uh, into the topic of the red capitals, uh, I also have uh, news and but breaking news to announce that uh, about what's happening in Hong Kong, because under the new national security law, uh, all, uh, all political pos uh, politicians and activists were under attack under uh, prosecutions. So what's happening in the past few days? is that there's a national security law case in which all prominent uh, politicians and activists were prosecuted. And the, the result was just out amongst the 47 who were prosecuted. Uh, 32 of them failed to get bailed. And 15, even they got bailed, but still pending review by higher courts. That means that the total of 47 of them will be waiting in jail for at least a year or two before the formal trial. I, I feel heartbroken about that. I have no word to describe the pain Hong Kongers are feeling. So the, the regime has attacked Hong Kong's freedom now to the extremes. But of course, uh, the oppressions to Hong Kong's freedoms uh, does not end at that. There are also persecutions uh, again, uh, against us in all aspects, all walks of life. For example, uh, this week, this coming weekend, Beijing will probably announce uh, its proposal to change Hong Kong's electoral system drastically to favor for Beijing camp and politicians. And politi politicians, political participations by Democrats uh, will be almost banned in, in the coming future. And also civil servants are required now to take oath to pledge loyalty uh, to the regimes or face punishments. We can also see uh, the attack on media with uh, Jimmy Lai from the next, uh, next media organizations will probably lose its main headquarter office building pending trial of his own case under national security law. Journalists get arrested for reporting wrongdoings of governments and police brutality. Teachers supporting freedom movements all get disqualified or prosecuted in court. But on top of these obvious persecutions, what's harder for the world to see in details is the softer power, perhaps not really soft, economic coercions that Beijing is introducing to Hong Kong and to the world. Beijing does not want to conquer every, uh, does not only want to conquer every single space in Hong Kong's civil liberty. It wants to conquer every corner of the economic world. This can be achieved by pumping in red capital, by infiltrations of institutions behind the scene. I personally tasted how private business sector became an ally of the, of the oppressive Hong Kong regimes with my experience with HSBC. On the first day of my exile, HSBC froze my accounts, all accounts, visa and saving check accounts. Following, all my family members' accounts also frozen, even they are not uh, 
involved in public affairs or politics at all. And to date, um, my accounts and my family's accounts are still frozen. And it all happened without notifications uh, by HSBC, without explaining even one reason to me why it has happened. HSBC only waited for the Hong Kong police to announce in a press conference uh, its accusation on me for ridiculous reasons of money laundering, misappropriation of funds, for etc. So, under the huge pressure by uh, parliamentarians and MPs in the UK and in Europe, HSBC finally expressed that it had no choice but to do it under the Hong Kong security law. But what's supposed to be done is to urge the police to get a court order or fight the case in court, but not by oppressing uh, dissidents' freedom like that. HSBC is only one example of how even international business, no matter how prestigious, uh, renowned enterprises they are, uh, will completely total to uh, tyranny when its business interest, economic interest, is at the hand of CCP. We can also see from examples of many other international uh, business in Hong Kong and in the world, for example, Swire, for example, Cathay Pacific, are all under pressure by CCP to pledge loyalty and with the capital involved in their own uh, red capitals, involved in their own institutions and organizations. And on the, in other areas, we have seen CCP's red capital started to buy up media organizations in Hong Kong. Uh, as a result, senior veteran journalists, chief editors were forced uh, were to be sacked and replaced by Beijing controlled uh, people. So this does not end only in Hong Kong with the superpowers money. It wants to buy up the whole world. It has already started building its own economic emperor in the world. We people living in free countries should all be warned how far reaching the red capital the infiltration can be. It's so it, it is important to analyze, uh, to examine red capitals in details, the network behind it, its linkage between economic manipulations within institutions and public policies and how they are formed, the linkage between them. So I thank I thank Hong Kong Watch and for all its efforts uh, in launching uh, the report and for the efforts in looking into the details. And it's a very timely warning. Uh, as Ben just mentioned, it's a warning sign not only for Hong Kong institutions, but for the world, that it's time to stop that manipulation. It's now to stop that oppressive power in from infiltrating into the free world. So I hope that uh, uh, the world will look at the report and this will be influential in other parliaments uh, with regards to forming their own uh, China policies. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Ted. And let me say, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone here in saying how uh, extremely sorry I, we all are uh, about the, the latest news. Um, there's been a constant stream of extremely bad news from Hong Kong for uh, some time now, but the news today is, is yet more yeah. bad news. Um, and also extremely sorry for the uh, personal challenges you faced with HSBC, and that's something we will continue to uh, raise and, and to highlight. Um, it's now a, a pleasure to invite my colleague uh, Johnny Patterson now to say a bit more about the report, our recommendations, uh, and uh, and where we go from here. Jo Johnny. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, it's an honour to be speaking to you all today and a real, really fascinating privilege doing this research as well. Um, so one of the questions which has driven our research is, is what explains the 
quiet acceptance of the Hong Kong business elite to the unraveling of one country, two systems. Our view is that the fact that Swire Pacific, HSBC, Jardines, the tycoons have all lined up to endorse the national security law is a measure of the success of Beijing's long run strategy to bring the local economy into line. Because these business leaders haven't always happily sung from the Communist Party's hymn sheet. It's helpful to look back at 2003. Hong Kong was in the middle of a coronavirus outbreak, a national security law debate, and a mass protest movement. It looks pretty familiar to what we've seen in the last year, but in 2003, it was James Tien, whose Liberal Party had the backing of Hong Kong tycoons who voted down the unpopular national security legislation. At that point, it was the tycoons and the democratic movement who formed a temporary alliance to defeat a draconian piece of legislation which countered both of their interests. In 2020, we saw the same ingredients, but a very different outcome. And this is not because the global firms have suddenly had a, a Damascene conversion to Chinese state capitalism. They know full well that the erosion of one country, two systems cuts against their direct interests. But the economic circumstances have changed and the huge influx of mainland money and assets, red capital in other words, into Hong Kong, combined with the increased dependency of the city's other firms on Chinese markets mean that when Beijing made the acceptance of the national security law a red line issue for businesses, the majority fell into line. Mainland firms make up 60% of the Hong Kong stock market, and increasingly they provide an example for their peers to emulate, a model for their Western and Hong Kong competitors of how to curry favour with Beijing. International firms are finding themselves left in, with the sticky decision of choosing whether to follow their principles and risk punishment, or to kowtow and curry favour. We see with Cathay Pacific, who were almost pushed to bankruptcy after some of their employees um, decided to take part in protests, the risk for many of these firms who are now totally dependent on their access to China on going against the wishes of the Communist Party. And so we started to ask what the significance of the findings of our report were for geopolitics and for international relations with China. And first off, our sense is that Hong Kong is, is something of a canary in the coal mine. It provides lessons for Western policymakers about Beijing's dual strategies for economic coercion. First, the mobilization of Chinese firms for political end, and second, the co-option of multinationals who owe them allegiance because of their dependency. The British government should be alarmed that it is a British bank, HSBC, that has so publicly undermined its foreign policy objectives by siding with the Chinese government over the joint declaration. In the UK, we increasingly appear to have a fairly incoherent approach to China policy with the Department of International Trade and the Treasury seeking to extend the golden era of Sino-British relations on the one hand and the Foreign Office dealing with the, um, the fallout of China breaking international norms and international law in Hong Kong and Xinjiang. Undoubtedly, the vested interests that we see at work in Hong Kong, freezing Ted's assets and etc. Um, play into this dynamic. I think the European Union also faces similar dilemmas um, and for a slightly different reason, because in the during the Eurozone crisis, um, there was a mass sell off of public assets and Chinese state owned enterprises were were kind of big players in buying these up. So from Greece to Portugal to Cyprus, there is major strategic dependency and vulnerability to China. Hong Kong shows the risks of this, and this is one of the reasons why we're opposed to the the new EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, because we believe it will only strengthen the hand of these mainland firms and weaken Europe's ability to act autonomously if Beijing crosses the line further in Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and even Taiwan. Finally, one specific area we believe deserves greater scrutiny are the growing ties between the international and Chinese financial systems. It's striking that during the trade war, financial ties between the US and China actually increased as a result of the opening of markets in China. Investors now are flocking to invest capital into index tracking funds which track major indices like the MSCI Emerging Markets Index and are therefore pouring billions into China's capital markets. There seems to be a fundamental inconsistency to the idea of sanctioning Chinese individual officials for gross human rights violations on the one hand while simultaneously allowing pension funds and institutional investors to provide capital to firms complicit in the same gross human rights violations. Um, 
And so we're, we're increasingly thinking through policy options on this. And one particular area of growing interest for us is the issue of the relationship between ethical investment, ESG in other words, and human rights. This is relevant in China, but it's also relevant in Myanmar, Russia, and elsewhere. It's particularly pressing when it comes to the most grave violations. So, so violations like genocide, ethnic cleansing, or modern day slavery. And yet the conversation still very much feels as though it's in its infancy. This is relevant in many financial centers around the world, and there should be a multilateral conversation about it. But it has to start with individual parliaments and individual governments. And that's why we are really honored today to have with us Rishanara Ali, the MP for Bethnal Green, who sits on the Treasury Select Committee and has bringing some really interesting ideas forward in the UK context around um, what financial services can do to carry this conversation around ESG forwards. And I'm going to pass back to Ben to kind of give Rishanara a more proper introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Johnny, for that excellent uh, summary. Um, just before um, uh, I invite Rashnara to uh, to speak. Uh, let me just remind you that um, we will have a time of Q and A uh, af afterwards, and you can send questions through to me in the chat function. Um, so do do start uh, thinking of your questions. But it's a really great um, pleasure to uh, welcome Rashnara uh, Ali. Um, uh, we've had the privilege of, of working with Rashnara uh, in recent months, particularly. Although I've uh, uh, had had the pleasure of working together. Uh, on issues, particularly as Johnny says, in Burma, Myanmar, um, uh, and uh, Roshanara, we'd, we'd love to invite you now to give us that broader perspective, not necessarily limited to the uh, Chinese Communist Party, uh, but the issues that, as Johnny says, uh, around ESG, around ethical investment. Uh, I know you come at this particularly out of a concern for for genocide, especially, um, and and you've taken a recent initiative with the fin Financial Services Bill, so. Um, we look forward to hearing from you now. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, Johnny and Ben, uh, particularly Johnny, for your work on this really excellent report, which I know will be valuable to parliamentarians, not just in the UK, but elsewhere in the world. And it's been really um, fascinating hearing from Dr. Malte um, Keating and, of course, the inspirational uh, remarks from Ted Hugh, uh, and I'm like Ben, I'm very sorry to hear about the recent developments. Uh, I've had the opportunity to visit Hong Kong a number of times, and uh, I think my good friend Eric Chow is on this call, who I worked with um, in my previous life when I was uh, working for the Young Foundation. And he was at the Li Ka Shing Foundation and uh, many friends there. And I wouldn't have imagined 15 you know, years ago, 10, 15 years ago, that Hong Kong would be in the situation that it, it faces now. But in a way, the signs were already there, um, not because we bemoan the rise of China in the West, but because, uh, as as was said in, in the beginning um, uh, by Dr. Malt about the way in which global capitalism has capitalism has been played out and the way in which uh, the world sort of uh, has operated and China in that context. Um, and as someone who has a close connection with Asia, someone who was brought up in South Asia, uh, you know, the way in which the global economy has been um, tilting towards Asia's direction, it, you know, has, uh, is, is a complex um, picture. Uh, and, you know, certainly uh, when we look at economic development and the the alleviation of poverty within mainland China uh, over the previous decades, there were many areas where we could say that those are examples of great success. But the reality is that where we are now is the rising uh, increase in authoritarianism, where uh, the situation is such that uh, the the repression uh, of particular groups, minorities, the violation of human rights, which is obviously particularly um, acute in relation to Hong Kong, but also within the mainland in the way that the Uyghur Muslims have been treated. And of course, the uh, way in which other governments are being propped up 
um, in relation to or where action at the international level is being blocked by certain actors, um, certain countries, including China, mean that human rights is under threat and has been under threat for a very long time, standing up for human rights and democracy is standing up for human rights. Um, uh, have uh, th those our democracy has been tested as have others uh, and that's where the interface between the rise of China uh, and I'm not singling out China there are other countries Russia is another example uh, uh, has has not been certainly on the democracy on the human rights front has not been uh, uh, what some might have hoped it would be and in terms of in terms of the geopolitics of all of this, uh, what's happened in recent years uh, with the Trump administration as well is that we've seen a gradual undermining of inter international the international rules-based system. We've seen a gradual or rapid undermining, in fact, of uh, respect for human rights uh, and a tolerance of ethnic cleansing and genocide uh, whether it's uh, in Rakhine, uh, in the Burma context, or in uh, in within mainland China against the Uyghur. And the signal has been from uh, uh, Western governments is that uh, we are fairly impotent in taking action. Uh, and likewise, it applies to finance, um, that there, there are too many, it's too difficult. It's too difficult to act because China will block um, uh, certain uh, advances or efforts in the UN Security Council or China's too powerful or the, 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 our business interests are, um, are such that um, we don't want to engage in politics. Even I've even heard politicians say, political uh, ministers say, uh, well, that's too political, uh, um, even when we're talking about genocide. So what does that mean for uh, for countries that are or populations that are facing repression? Uh, it means that uh, what we're seeing is much more fragmentation in the way that uh, that countries that care about societies that care about democracy and human rights act. And what we need to do is find ways of bringing those countries together to be able to act collectively. Uh, in order to apply the kind of pressure that is needed to bring to bear on countries like China. Otherwise, it's not going to be possible to achieve change or to have respect for human rights and uh, respect for uh, principles that we all believe in. Uh, because too often what we see is, um, including in our own country, uh, talk of respect for human rights and values, but when it comes to action, the action is not followed through. So that takes me on to the recent debates in the UK. Uh, to give you some context, um, uh, and, and thanks again to Hong Kong Watch, um, Lord Alton uh, has been in, introduced a uh, an amendment in the House of Lords uh, in relation to trade uh, and genocide, uh, an amendment that would make it uh, possible for our government to take action uh, against um, countries that, in, when 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 um, supporting when developing trade deals, uh, that there'd be an opportunity to uh, ensure that there are checks uh, and balances to prevent trade deals happening without sufficient consideration to um, uh, human rights violations and genocide. And we also recently worked on a parallel amendment in Parliament. Uh, to look at how we can ensure financial services behave appropriately and provide due regard to human rights issues uh, through the ESG provision. Uh, and too often what, what we see, as you've already heard, is that businesses think it's not their business to it could be involved in human rights. Uh, businesses turn a blind eye at their worst when it when their supply chains are uh, are being uh, marred with um, with uh, practices that 
amount to extreme violations of people's rights. You've seen, you will have seen that in many cases. Uh, I don't have to tell any of you uh, whether it's to do with um, uh, clo the clothing sector or even the recent scandals of um, PPE equipment uh, and um, slave, uh, slave labor. Uh, in the 21st century, we should not uh, be having to have this discussion. Uh, uh, it should not be allowed. Even 15, 20 years ago, we might have thought this could not possibly happen. So what does it mean when a major world economy, one of the largest economies in the world, um, is, is uh, prosecuting uh, activity that is in direct contravention of human rights. How do we stop that from happening? Um, we've got to make sure that the to the way we do trade has takes seriously the human rights agenda. That's just not happened. It's not happened in the West. You know, there's far too much hypocrisy, frankly, uh, as we've already heard. Whether it's to do with the um, co-opting of multinationals uh, by. Uh, the Chinese government at the moment uh, and other kinds of interests where profit uh, takes um, primary, cent takes centre stage over all else. Um, are there parallels that we can look at? Uh, certainly, we can look at the parallels in relation to climate change where we are beginning to get much more engagement from business, but it has to go hand in hand. To make that happen, the regulations need to be right. Uh, the financial uh, regulators in our country need to take this agenda extremely seriously. Uh, that's not happening enough yeah, up and down uh, many, many nation states. Uh, and we need international cooperation with those countries that, are, uh, that um, are concerned about what's happening and the role of China. This is not about unfairly disadvantaging emerging economies. This is about making sure that everybody plays by, by rules. Uh, that we want to see in a world where human rights violations are taken taken seriously, where uh, repression is punished rather than uh, countries just standing by and letting it happen. Uh, I know we're a long way from that, but what I think we do need to do is look at how we encourage parliaments, not just our parliament in the UK, but parliaments in different countries to apply pressure to ensure that the regulatory framework and our regulators build this agenda into what they do. Uh, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't it doesn't fall into the too difficult category or too political category. Uh, if genocide and human rights violations um, uh, are not serious enough for regulators and for governments. I can't think of anything else that is more serious. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rashnara. That's uh, an extremely important and powerful point on which to, to conclude the formal contributions. Um, uh, and we now have a chance, uh, we have about 20 minutes for uh, some Q&A. <coughs> there are currently no um, questions in the chat that I can see, unless I'm looking at the wrong function. Um, uh, and that's either because our audience is still thinking or because our speakers have uh, covered everything so perfectly that they've answered uh, everybody's questions. But while um, while people are hopefully thinking of some questions, maybe I could, um, I mean, there were several questions in my mind, uh, but maybe I could just come back firstly to the question of, of what's happened with TED and and, and others. Uh, uh, with HSBC, and I wonder if I can ask all, all of uh, the speakers, but starting with Ted, what uh, uh, what can actually be done uh, about this, um, particularly as HSBC has more recently uh, uh, announced um, its its uh, pivot to Asia and 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 its reduction in its business in uh, particularly the United States. Um, what's the power of either governments or consumer power or any other form of pressure uh, that uh, could make a, a, a difference. Um, so, Ted, do you want to, to start on that? Yeah, sure about that. Uh, from the HSBC case, what we can see as the main point is that uh, there are financial guidelines HSBC was supposed to follow. Uh, there are best practices uh, written in, in formal documents that they had to follow. But then as professional bankers, they have their professional code of conduct to follow. 
but those steps and procedures and guidelines are not taken seriously, were not followed at all. And as we were pressing for an answer for HSBC to uh, to face the public, but uh, it will just be evading all the questions. So uh, we can see why even big businesses, uh, influential stakeholders, uh, private sectors are trying to uh, abandon the, their professions and even take risk of uh, be, uh, doing illegal acts for the regimes. It's the economic power uh, behind it that's driving it to do so. And what's that economic power that the regime has? So uh, if you recall the moment that the, uh, the former chief, chief executive, Si Wai Liang, actually after he, uh, he uh, he's no longer the chief executive, but he's very active on social media and he was uh, posting, uh, uh, making posts every day on social media, attacking HSBC uh, last year for counting the days that it has not made openly its stance in supporting national security, security law. And it has also warned that uh, the thousands um, of clients HSBC have will definitely be gone and be switched to other banks. And so there will be no place for business uh, with HSBC. So you can see these kinds of economic duress or threats uh, play upon a private prosecution. And even the bank like HSBC had, has a quota. And I, I believe, of course, that's not completely because of the red capital, but then uh, with other organizations, uh, can you, you can imagine with red capital, uh, with the positions all replaced by Beijing friendly people without uh, private business, uh, general policy uh, can be totally influenced by the regime. And you see where the power of the red capital is and, and the connection is. Thank you, Ted. Would, would any of uh, the other speakers like to comment on this one? If if not, uh, I'll um, I'll go to another question. This is a question um, for for any of the speakers, but um, particularly for Rashanara. Um, uh, should there be uh, the this, uh, the questioner asks? Should there be a, an organised international coalition um, to to address or to regulate uh, human rights abuses uh, from China and, and other authoritarian governments uh, uh, alongside emerging economies via some kind of international financial policy? Uh, so I guess that's a question about international coordination in in approaching this. I mean, I, I think I think any attempt to try and corral different countries uh, and coordinate a response it, it would be helpful, uh, because otherwise individual countries acting alone uh, are going to struggle for the very reasons that other speakers have pointed out, and and particularly uh, the points about uh, finance and how finance and uh, economics is being used, uh, not just for uh, benign economic growth and activity, but because it serves a broader political geo uh, political uh, agenda. Uh, so I think, uh, but but that doesn't take away from the current, you know, the focus that needs to be there on uh, applying pressure on the current institutions uh, and also ensuring that the institutions that are in place uh, enforce. Uh, the rules and that we can operate uh, according to the the rules based system that uh, that would help advance human rights. Uh, I'm not saying it's perfect. Of course, it's imperfect, and there are lots of barriers that we're we're all familiar with. Um, but uh, so we've got to do both. We've got to look at where the gaps are and and coordinate and apply pressure on countries that are uh, that that like China that are in this position. Uh, as well as use the existing in international institutions. Thank you, Roshnara. Um, I, I believe that um, your colleague, uh, Roshnara, uh, your colleague uh, Stephen Kinnock is with us and has his hand up, I've just been told. Stephen, oh, do, do you want to unmute and 
make a contribution. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Benedict, and, and thanks so much to the panel for really interesting um, contributions and, and the report, I think, is absolutely excellent. I, I was just wondering what uh, thoughts are on um, the National Security and Investment Bill, which the government has introduced. I think it's going through its final stages um, in through Parliament. And obviously, they've set up a system there whereby the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy will be able to call in uh, investments in the British economy where it is felt that there's potentially risks around um, who is backing those investments, uh, to whom do the investors owe their allegiance, the extent to which uh, it is also, you know, risks around coming off the back of COVID, a lot of distressed British businesses, potentially rich pickings for being snapped up by investment vehicles and, and other companies potentially linked to uh, China's uh, military industrial complex. Um, and I, I'm just wondering if, if anyone has thoughts on the National Security and Investment Bill and whether you feel that it actually will be a sufficient safeguard um, in terms of many of the things we're talking about here around reducing independence, uh, reducing dependence, I should say, and increasing uh, independence and sovereign capability. It's not directed to anyone uh, in particular. Uh, very happy for anybody on the panel to to comment on that. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Stephen, and, and uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you for all you do on, on these issues. Um, can I ask which of our speakers would like to respond to that? I'm happy to chip something in. Um, I guess I guess my feeling is that it's definitely a step forwards, um, but that is probably insufficient on its own. Um, and that one of the big questions, which I think I alluded to in, in what I was saying going forwards, is the is that issue of um, the incoherence yeah. and the fact the government seems to be playing against itself. And so you have one day you have um, Dominic Raab coming out with a fairly robust statement. The next we're hearing that uh, Magnitsky sanctions are being vetoed by number 10. The next we're hearing that Boris is saying there might be a new trade deal and he's pushing for. And it's kind of the cakeism, have, have your cake and eat it approach is just doesn't feel sufficiently strategic given the kind of importance of this issue. And so while the national, well, I, I think that that bill sounds like it is is going in the right direction. Um, the presence of and the power of vested interests like HSBC and other institutions who are enormously level, have kind of enormous dependency on China um, is, is to me feels like a cause cause for concern and something that needs to be looked at more properly. I think there's also a a point that needs people need to think more properly around. Um, at the moment, the debate is very much framed. Kind of on one hand, you, on one side you have the national security and values values driven foreign policy people. On the other side, you have the economy, and I'm not convinced about that binary because I think Britain's long term economic health is going to be um, aided by us not being too dependent in the long run on on Beijing and having loads of our firms being picked off, uh, vulnerable being picked off there. So that's just a couple of thoughts. Thanks, thanks, Johnny. Um, we, we have a few questions that have just come in, um, and we probably have time uh, to get through two or three of them. Sorry, Stephen, did, did you want to come back on that? Oh, no, no, thanks. That's great. Thank you. No, I, oh, I, you know, I, I agree with Johnny. It's a step in the right direction, but a massive missed opportunity as well. The, the, the bill just doesn't, it's not strong enough. But uh, thanks very much for that. Great. No, th thank you. Um, so we've had several questions. We've probably got time to get through two or three of them. And we've had um, actually two or three on a similar theme. So I'm going to try and combine them. Um, a couple of questions that are specifically addressed to Malty, um, but others are certainly welcome to comment on this, around what um, developing countries uh, can learn from the influx uh, of red capital in Hong Kong. Um, and how emerging economies, um, which are already subject to a lot of coercion from China, uh, can, uh, can address this. Um, and a related question um, of 
really the same the same question uh how red capital uh, shows issues in the functioning of global capitalism um and what we can do um multi do you want to tackle that combination of issues and maybe johnny could add something if, if you'd like to thank you very much yeah i think uh, these are very uh, good questions uh, difficult questions um but i think uh what uh, it shows us the Hong Kong example uh, shows us in terms of uh, uh, what is important is the, the robustness of institutions. I think this is really something um, which is quite worrying, uh, especially if we look at um, developing countries and emerging economies in the global south, that they are becoming a, a yeah, play ball between different um, yeah, interests, global interests. and. Um, I think, uh, therefore, the um, yeah building up uh, robust uh, net or, yeah linkages uh, to, for example, in countries uh, or with liberal democracies. I think that would be some an opportunity uh, for Europe or Britain and the U.S. to uh, yeah to lead on on these uh, areas to yeah help um, uh, these countries to be less vulnerable, that their institutions will be less vulnerable. Um, on the other hand, I think it will be quite, I'm quite pessimistic about this in, in general, about the influence of uh, red capital in uh, developing countries because of the uh, pandemic. And uh, this country has led, of course, on this uh, cutting uh, aid uh, to these countries. So then, of course, uh, countries uh, like, like China will swoop in and uh, uh, take the opportunity uh, to provide more aid. And I think that isn't, uh, it's quite short term, isn't it, um, in this regard. So I think for us in the global north, uh, in uh, liberal democracies, um, it it's, would be wise to have a longer perspective um, on these uh, uh, qu questions of what kind of globalized world we want to look live in in the future. And I think the pandemic has been, uh, in this regard, quite eye-opening and uh, showing the, all the different linkages. And you can see where we might not be very comfortable in taking a Sinovac uh, vaccine. Countries in the global south are completely reliant on this. Yeah? And you can look at Canada, who has, I don't know, five times the necessary, uh, the, the required vaccines are holding it. It doesn't, doesn't really play out in, in this way. So that would be my quite um, yeah, divertive uh, answer, but I hope I uh, can apply some of the questions. Thank you very much, Marty. Johnny or, or Rashnara, would you like to comment on this as well? I, I mean, I, I can I can do. Uh, I mean, I, I think if we look at the experience for developing countries with China, uh, it's been a really complicated picture. and quite quite considerably negative in some parts but on the other hand some of those countries will say uh, they were able to do strategic uh, work and infrastructure and got infrastructure done faster than they were getting to to do because things are much slower through the world bank and those sorts of financing facilities so we've got to if if western countries want to have a greater influence in emerging economies and developing economies, then as uh, Malta was saying, we need to stop slashing budgets uh, to developing economies, but we also need to provide other kinds of support. So infrastructure investment uh, needs to be in there in the mix because actually it's become an even bigger kind of um, competition for influence in those countries and we see that from the way that china some of the bad examples like the what they've done in sri lanka for instance where um the the government to government uh, loans um for infrastructure um if the government can't pay it then they take it over and then you've got much more control uh so some of these emerging economies are finding themselves uh, belatedly in quite a difficult position and they're working in election cycles and so on. So, so that means uh, we've got to, we've got to decide, you know, in, in uh, democratic nations, what kind of relationship we want to have with these countries. You can't, uh, you can't have it both ways, you know, you, you, on the one hand, withdraw support, but then expect to have influence. 
uh, it's got to be longer term and strategic. And, uh, and one of the sad from realities is that the la over the last sort of 20 years or so, Britain's had uh, a much more longer term view of international development. That's just been torn to pieces by our government by, by deciding to renege on the 0.7% commitment. Uh, and we're an international leader in this. And as for um, the red capital element uh, and what that means, I think I think we've got to, in a way, I mean, uh, there wasn't much uh, much in the last few years of what the US was doing, but certainly thinking through what kind of pressure is applied to the Chinese government in terms of respecting um, the uh, the com the rules around competition, WTO rules, uh, countries actually following uh, the rules-based system. Uh, is critical, but also there are a whole set of issues around technology, which we haven't talked about. Technology in, in playing um, uh, in terms of uh, economic development, but also in terms of um, human rights violations. So it's got these double. Uh, there's a double-edged sword. There's lots of positives around technology, but uh, China is increasingly using technology as a route to towards this arms race of um, influence and um, undue influence uh, in different countries. Uh, so. The international community that's interested in the way this is playing out uh, and the negative consequences needs to be able to 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 act together to apply the kind of pressure that you need because the sum of those parts of the, of the influence that our different governments have is going to be much greater and we might then have some chance of um, uh, containing the worst excesses of abuses um, that the Chinese government is responsible for. Otherwise, I don't think we've got a great deal of, you know, we've got a great chance of doing that. And, uh, and in terms of how those emerging economies develop, uh, well, they are very dependent on China. But, and shifting that dependence requires massive reallocation of resources uh, from countries like ours. And that, that's not likely to happen, but a concerted effort working together might uh, might offer a different alternative to, country, to countries so that they don't feel the only uh, game in town is China. So they have to go to China because actually everybody else is sort of walking away. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We, we are pretty much out of time. There is just one question which... Maybe I could just use to to round off on um, uh, very briefly, and particularly for, for you, Rashnara. Um, uh, the question is: Would the panel advocate that the British Parliament should make a law equivalent to a U.S. law that stipulates that any company that fails to comply with financial regulators' requirements for information disclosure for three years should be removed from listing and and trading on securities markets? Is that a is that an option? Well, I think I think we should certainly look at those sorts of examples. Obviously, you know, each country is different, so we 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 would need to look at how it would apply to the UK. Uh, but at the moment, there's a set, there's a kind of there's a sense that, that our government and our regulators have a, a fair amount of ambivalence in all of this. They sort of behave like it's not their business, but human rights is absolutely their business, uh, and so. Uh, which is why the amendment that I was proposing with colleagues in other parties, uh, uh, it, it, you know, was was focused in on what the what our financial services regulator can do. Uh, just as you know, it took us quite a long time to get the Bank of England and the FCA to start to start thinking about the environment, finance, and environment as a major major area to focus on. Um, ironically, human the human rights agenda has taken a back seat. Uh, when it should be front and center. Uh, and, and I think, I know it's been, uh, obviously it's incredibly depressing what's happening in Hong Kong and also in 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 relation to the Uyghur uh, population and the genocide in Rakhine, in Rakhine State um, in Myanmar. But I think we've got to use this moment to to take action, to change the way our financial services operate and, and I really think that the only way we're going to do that is um, is by working together. And in a way, it's a hopeful sign that the Amer the Americans are starting to lead on this agenda. Uh, what we need to do is get more countries behind those sorts of efforts. Well, that's a, a really important note on which to end. Uh, the, your phrase, human rights are absolutely our, our business, uh, is a, a key thought um, to take forward. 
Um, as always with these uh, kind of events, and especially with a topic as as important but as complex as this, um, this is only the start of a conversation, and um, it's probably raised more questions uh, than it's answered. Although although you've uh, certainly answered uh, a good number of questions, um, so I think we're going to conclude uh, here. But just to say that um, this is the beginning of a, a conversation. We uh, certainly plan to roll out this report uh, uh, globally, uh, have a series of these kind of events um, in different uh, capitals, try to engage people in, in the financial sector uh, and, and try to find ways to, to address these, these really important questions. So uh, I'm sorry for anyone else who had questions that uh, we've run out of time for, but thank you to everyone who's joined uh, as part of our audience uh, and a particular Thank you to our four speakers, to, to Malti K. Ding, uh, to Ted Hoi, um, to Russian R. Ali, and to my colleague, Johnny Patterson. And again, congratulations to Johnny and Sam for their work on this report. And please do take the report. It's on our website. Um, it's already been reported on in, in the Daily Telegraph and other media. Um, please get the word out. Uh, get policymakers around the world looking at it. And let's uh, take this forward and um, find solutions to these issues. Thank you all very much. Thank you.